Shall we continue our study of the New Testament and open up to the book of First Thessalonians chapter 3, picking up where we left off last time? Here in chapter 3 where the message this morning is entitled, News of Your Commitment Has Greatly Comforted Us. News of Your Commitment Has Greatly Comforted Us. As we mentioned last week, And even the week before, Paul and his crew had planted the church in Thessalonica during their second mission trip. Uh, They had first come to the region of Macedonia, which is this region up here, and they went first to the church, or planted the church in Philippi, but were then persecuted when Paul cast a demon out of a servant girl, which was good for her, but bad for her master's psychic soothsaying business. Her owners convinced the city officials that Paul and Silas were a scourge to the city, and so they uh, convinced them to beat Paul and Silas with rods, with really long sticks, and then cast them into prison. But undaunted, Paul and Silas then focused on prison ministry, and they held a Christian rock concert uh, from their from their uh, prison cell. And as we like to say, God then rocked the place. Back in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25, we read, At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. The first Jesus rock and roll concerts. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. That's quite an earthquake when your chains just fall off. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword, was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, we are all here. And he called for a light, ran in, fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out, saying, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's what you call an open door. Open door of ministry. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them uh, the same hour of the night, washed their stripes. Immediately he and his family were baptized. Well, the next day the city officials realized they had nothing for which to hold Paul and Silas on. So they released them. Paul and his crew then went to Thessalonica and spent a grand total of three weeks there. They would have stayed longer, but as you know, a group of Jealous, non-believing Jewish men gathered an angry mob to go after Paul and Silas. They attacked the home where Paul was staying. Paul and his team, however, escaped unharmed, and uh, they left town. Then they went to the city of Berea. And as we read in Acts chapter 17, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether the things, these things were so. So Paul spoke, and the Bereans then had the, the scriptures, and they made sure that what they were hearing was true from the scriptures, and therefore many of them believed. And also not a few of the Greeks, meaning a whole lot of them, and prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica, those non-believers who had persecuted Paul, tried to to find him, when they uh, learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also, stirred up the crowds. Immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens. He's traveling south now to Greece. And receiving a commandment for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now, While Paul was in Athens, Paul became concerned about that fledgling church in Thessalonica, the church he had only spent three weeks with. He was so concerned that he sent Timothy back to them to find out how they were doing and to build them up in their faith and to teach them more about the Bible. Well, Paul and the rest of his team eventually made it down to Corinth. Timothy's there in Thessalonica. Paul and his team travel from Athens to Corinth, where the Lord opened up a great door of ministry for them. They stayed there for over a year, during which time Timothy rejoined them and reported that the Thessalonian Christians were doing well, which then Paul, in response, wrote this letter that we're studying today. Last week we covered chapter 2 where Paul expressed his concern for the young church in his absence 
In chapter 2, verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians, we read, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. We have no idea how Satan hindered them. But what wasn't a mystery was Paul's great desire to see them again, that they might be further grounded in their faith and then become even more fruitful in their ministry until the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Notice in chapter 2, verse 19, he says, What is our hope, our joy, or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For we, or excuse me, you are our, our glory and joy. So everything about the return of Jesus Christ, being faithful to him, loving him, loving one another, serving him, ministering to other people, all the way until the day when Jesus comes back for us. Which brings us now to chapter 3, where Paul expresses how his concerns for them were turned to joy after he received news from Timothy. In verses 1 through 5, he describes his apprehension while he was there in Athens Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, because we were worried about your spiritual state, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and send Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. Timothy became part of Paul's mission team during the early days of this second Mission trip. Now, during Paul's first mission trip, he had come to Lystra where he had ran, run into some fierce opposition. The first mission trip is this, this black line here. The second mission trip traces, or the, or the green line traces, the second missionary trip during which Paul was there in Corinth and he wrote to the Thessalonians. But as you see on the first one, they went this way, they came up and around down to Iconium and Lystra. And there in Lystra, things got pretty, pretty tense. In Acts 14, we read, Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. Having persuaded the multitude, they stoned Paul with rocks, by the way. For you hippies, just clarifying. Okay. Stoned him with stones. Okay. And dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. They, they thought he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. What a spiritual stud. Going back into the city that just stoned you? Now, many were close to the gospel. That There, there were some who were very open to the gospel. Among them was a young man named Timothy. Now, fast forward several years. Paul and his team embarked on that second mission trip, that which is in green, and this time they went through Derby and Lystra and Iconium first before going on toward Philippi and Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth. While here, they met up with this young, totally on fire for the Lord, young man named Timothy. And it was decided that Timothy should become part of Paul's mission team. Timothy became such a benefit that Paul entrusted him to go back to the Thessalonians to encourage them in their faith. Specifically, as we read in verse 3 of, of chapter 3, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. They were being afflicted. We'll deal with that in a second. For you yourselves know that we are appointed for this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened as you know. Though Paul had only spent three weeks in Thessalonica, he made it clear that walking with the Lord can be dangerous to one's health. His proof being the wounds he still bore on his body from the beatings he received in Philippi. You know, Jesus also taught us that living for him invited persecution. In John 16, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Now, in the world you will have tribulation. There's one of your precious promises. There's one of those, you know, write it out and memorize the scripture. You know, so often we like to memorize the scriptures. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Therefore, nothing shall separate me from the love of God. And we like those verses, but what about this one? In the world, you will 
have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Jesus promised we would be persecuted. We would have tribulation. You want to live for the Lord. Guess what? The world doesn't. The world wants to get rid of every mention of God. The world is, is bent on trying to remove any traces of the knowledge of the Lord. Especially in our culture today. Jesus promised we would have tribulation. We would be persecuted. But he also promised that should we be persecuted, great will be our reward in heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you're called upon to endure persecution, guess what? You'll get to rub elbows with Isaiah and Elijah and Daniel and Jeremiah and Jonah. And Jonah might smell like fish, but that's another story. You get to rub elbows with some of these great men of God in the past who trusted God and remained faithful to him even in the face of great persecution. So Jesus told us we would be persecuted. Paul also warned everybody that he spoke to that we would be persecuted. To Timothy in his second epistle, he says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Hey, if someone told you, hey, come to Jesus and all your problems will just go away, they lied to you. They absolutely lied to you. And as we see the return of Jesus drawing nearer, don't be surprised should persecution intensify. There's a ministry called Voice of the Martyrs. And they've been around for a long time. They concluded in the last century alone, more Christians were martyred, killed for their faith, than in all of the previous centuries combined. And the statistics show that not only aren't things lightening up, they're getting even worse. Remember this, though. Our hope is not in being comfortable here and now. Our hope in Jesus is, so, is not so that he will provide for us the stuff of life. Oh, he takes care of our needs. No question about it. But yet there are plenty of people who he allows to go through persecution and martyrdom for his name's sake. And great will be their reward in heaven. Our hope is not in being comfortable here, but in the reward in the life to come. As it said, our retirement program is truly out of this world. Now, with that said, who wants to be persecuted? You know, it'd be crazy to say, oh, please sign me up. I'll be persecuted. No, that would be dumb. And <laughs> for non-believers especially, this issue of persecution, as it was for the Thessalonians, you've been there for three weeks, and during that time, persecution started to rise, and it continued on. That would have been awfully hard for them. Paul was afraid that these Thessalonians might have thought, man, if, if walking with Jesus invites all this stuff, forget it. Why would I want to walk with the Lord if, if I'm going to be persecuted, if I'm going to be made fun of? And so in writing here in chapter 3, verse 5, he says, For this reason, when we could no longer endure it, we're there in Athens, we're worried about you, we just couldn't stand it anymore, I sent to know your faith. Sent Timothy to find out how you were doing, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might have been in vain. That's what he feared most. All that effort, all of his own personal sufferings and labor might have been in vain had they not continued to walk with God. Were his labors in vain? What news would he have received from Timothy? You know, would there still be a church going strong, or would Timothy say, you know what? They all bailed on God. And that was something that Paul dreaded, hearing that they had bailed on the Lord. One, one last thing about the issue of persecution. Should you or I ever be persecuted? And during the persecution, being told that if we would just denounce the Lord, we could avoid the pain and suffering, which has happened many times in the past. And if we were told, hey, just, just say you don't believe in Jesus, and say you'll stop doing this, and, and we won't hurt you anymore. Should that ever come to you? Should you ever be tempted to do this? Know this. You can trust that God's grace is going to be sufficient to keep you faithful to him. 
I don't often recommend other books, but here's a book that's a fascinating read. It's called Fox's Christian Martyrs of the World. It chronicles the Christian martyrs from the beginning uh, when Jesus died for us and the 12 apostles all the way through the victims of the reign of Queen Mary in the 16th century. You know the, the alcoholic drink Bloody Mary? It's named after her because she was such a bloody queen. She violently opposed the Christian church, having many of them put to death. Well, there's a story here of a, a man named Timothy, not the Timothy that we're reading about, but somebody else. And we read, Timothy, a deacon of Mauritania in northern Africa, and Mara, his wife, had been married but three weeks when they were separated from each other by the persecution. Timothy was carried before Aranus, the governor, who did all in his power to induce him to worship heathen gods. But his efforts being vain, knowing that Timothy had the keeping of the sacred writings used in Christian worship, the governor commanded him to deliver them up that he might, they might be burned. Timothy answered, had I children, I would rather deliver them up to be burned than the word of God. The governor, much enraged at his reply, ordered that the prisoner's eyes be put out, saying, well, the books shall at least be useless to you, for now you cannot... See, to read them. Well, Timothy endured this punishment with such great patience. The governor grew more furious, ordered him to be hung by the feet with a weight tied about his neck and a gag in his mouth. This barbarous treatment Timothy bore with great courage. Some of the persons told the governor that he had been but newly married to a wife who is very fond. So he liked his wife. It's a good thing for husbands to do, by the way. And Arrhenius accordingly had Mara sent for and promised her a handsome reward with life of her husband if she would prevail upon him to sacrifice to the idols. So, hey, just have your husband sacrifice to idols and, and we'll spare his life and we'll give you lots of, lots of riches. And Mara, wavering in her faith, you know, poor woman, she's looking at her husband who's just been blinded, hanging upside down by the feet with a, a rope and a weight tied around his neck and gagged. Wavering in her faith, tempted by the bribe, impelled and, uh, by an unbounded affection for her husband, undertook to persuade him. And when taken to him, she assailed his constancy with all the moving eloquence of affection. Oh, please, spare yourself. Be my husband. Don't keep. So, don't be so stubborn. Well, as soon as the gag was taken out of Timothy's mouth in order to give him an opportunity to speak, instead of consenting to his wife's entreaties as they expected... He blamed her mistaken love. Woman, you're wrong. And declared his resolution of dying for the faith. Mara continued to beseech him till at his last her husband reproached her so bitterly for her weakness that she returned to his way of thinking and resolved to imitate his courage. He rebuked her. He said, you better repent and remain faithful to the Lord like I am. Timothy advised her to repair her fault by declaring that resolution to the governor. Go tell the governor that you were wrong in trying to persuade me. And being strengthened by his words and the grace and the grace of God. Now there's the key. As you read through this book, you see so often God strengthened. God gave them grace. God did a marvelous work of, of causing them to remain faithful. Should you ever be called upon to endure persecution and to maybe recant your faith, you can trust that God will give you grace. So by her husband's words and the grace of God, she went to Arrhenius and told him that she was ready to unite her husband in faith as well as love and was ready to suffer for her wicked conduct in, order to, in trying to make him an apostate. In other words, you know, I'm, I'm willing to die for what I had just done. I was wrong and, you know, Jesus is right and so do what you will. The governor immediately ordered her to be tortured, which was done with great severity. After this, Timothy and Mara were crucified side by side. Persecution's coming, gang. You know, already it's taking place in, in the public school system, colleges, universities, workplace, judicial system, government, from the top to the bottom. Persecution is taking place. Right now it's mainly a war of words. Don't. Tell me about that Jesus stuff. Take those Ten Commandments off the walls. We want nothing to do with any of this stuff. Do not be deceived. The closer we get to the Lord's return, the more 
persecution will come to the church. The good news, though, is that God will give you the grace to remain faithful to him. You can trust that. In verses 6 through 10, on a lighter note, Paul expresses that we were encouraged by Timothy, but we still long for another visit and more ministry. Now that Timothy has come from us to you and brought us good news of your faith and love. You know, these are two of the three great Christian virtues, faith and love, and the third, of course, being hope. Which, by the way, the Thessalonians also had. Chapter 1, Paul already commended them for their patience of hope. And he mentions over and over again what our hope is. Our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? And so he, he says, Timothy came and he told us of your faith. You still love the Lord. And your love. Your love for the Lord. Your love for us. Your love for other people. And also he said you also had hope. Timothy also reported in the next part of verse 6, and that you always have a good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live, if you stand fast in the Lord. Hey, as long as you're still walking with the Lord, man, I'm... I'm comforted. I can still endure all the trials and tribulations if you're still walking with the Lord. How comforting to know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Oh, it's so comforting. You know, it's good to see the fruit of one's labor. Not that we necessarily need a pat on the back. But certainly to know that our labor is not in vain. It's very encouraging to to hear that somebody's heart and life has been changed through the study of God's word. You know, if nothing's being done, if, if my ministry and, and service to the Lord doesn't accomplish anything, you know, why are we here? What are we doing? You know, I go and sell shoes or do, no, I don't want to do that. I don't know what I would do at that point, but if our ministry isn't for something, you know, even, even Paul talked about how the, the patient farmer must be one to partake of the fruits. And so, again, we don't need pats on the back, but certainly to know that, that somebody's been challenged and their lives are touched and changed through the study of God's word, man, that is so encouraging. Yes, I, I'll keep on keeping on now. I'll keep on going. I'm sure the same is true for you. You know that your labor's not in vain. It's encouraging. You want to keep on keeping on. Verse 9, For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God. Night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect that which is lacking in your faith. You know, here Paul mentions that he was praying for them night and day. He prayed for all of the churches a lot because he knew that prayer matters and he knew that prayer accomplishes great things. You know, prayer coupled with God's word are the most powerful weapons in our spiritual arsenal. Through prayer, we can cross vast distances, accomplish great and mighty things. Jesus was speaking to his disciples after the cursing of the fig tree one day, and it was withered the next day, and the disciples were so amazed. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to this fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast in the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. What a promise. Of course, there are many stipulations. The one in First John is whatever we pray for, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, that we shall receive. And so if you're praying for something that blesses God, that will honor Him, glorify Him, then you can guarantee that that thing is going to come to pass. And prayer covers vast distances. Paul wrote to the Philippians from a Roman prison. And he said, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You pray for me. You're way over there in Philippi, but I know that through your prayers, God will deliver me from my prison. Also, James tells us, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Should the church ever realize the power in prayer? 
Should we, the body of Christ, even this fellowship, should we fully understand or even just catch a glimpse of the knowledge of how powerful prayer is? And should we decide that we're really going to be committed to praying? That that's going to be first thing we do. And also what we do during the middle and what we do at the end. First, middle, last. That we pray, 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 pray without ceasing. Should we ever discover how powerful prayer is and commit to gathering together to pray? I have no doubt God is going to accomplish so many great mighty things that we can't even begin to understand. Now Paul mentioned he prayed for the church in Thessalonica, specifically in verses 11 through 13, the prayers that he prayed for them. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. Notice what he prayed for, that their love would increase and abound toward one another. Jesus said to his disciples, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. It's the most important thing we can pray for. Lord, teach me how to love one another. Teach me how to love others. Lord, help me to overlook things that bother me. Help me, Lord, to to let things go, to be forgiving and gracious like you are. Help me to love. If I have the opportunity to bless somebody, Lord, help me to show that I love them by serving. That's the greatest prayer we can pray. In addition to the next one, that we would increase in our love for God which, as Paul goes on to say, is manifested by holiness. Loving God is equivalent to being holy before him. Look at verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. He mentions this word holiness. It's the Greek word hagios, which means morally blameless and spiritually consecrated or set apart for a specific use. Morally blameless, spiritually consecrated, set apart from sinful desires, that we might be wholly given over for God's purposes. I love the definition Pastor Chuck Smith has given about the word holiness. He says, holiness, actually he says, holiness. You know who Pastor Chuck is, he talks slow and low. Holiness is getting as close to Jesus as you possibly can. Drawing as near to the Lord as you possibly can. Because the closer you get to Jesus, the more holy you will be. Notice how Paul prayed that they would be blameless and holy before God. Notice there at the end of verse 13. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So he mentions the coming of the Lord with all his saints. Next chapter, next week, we're going to talk about the rapture of the church. And we'll read that when Jesus comes back to rapture the the Christians who are alive on the earth, that he's also going to bring back with him those who had previously died in faith. So here Paul is exhorting them, be holy, morally pure and blameless, spiritually set apart unto God. Be holy. Why? Because Jesus is coming back at an hour you don't expect. He's coming back soon. Throughout this letter, Paul instructs them and also us about the Lord's second coming. And it's God's will that we eagerly anticipate and expect his return at any time. If you want, we're we're done here in 1 Thessalonians. You can turn to the left of your Bible to the the Gospel of Luke in chapter 12. Luke's Gospel, chapter 12 and verse 35. Where Jesus tells them, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Waist girded, that speaks of our service unto God. Lamps burning, that speaks of our witness before man. Serving the Lord. Sharing the gospel with other people. Let your waist be girded and let your lamps be burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. When he will return from the wedding and when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. 
The reason they're opening immediately is because they're expecting that he's there to return. And they got their hand on the doorknob. He's coming back and the moment I hear him knocking, I'm opening. I hear you knocking and you can come in. Unlike that other song. Just waiting, expecting the Lord to come back. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Watching for what? Watching for the master's return. Yes, there is an Antichrist coming, but we're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for the return of Jesus Christ. After that, the Antichrist will be revealed. But our concern is not wondering whether a former president or a current president or some, uh, some dictator across the, the ocean is the Antichrist. That's not our concern. Our concern is that we're waiting for Jesus to come back and that we're ready for him. Blessed are those. He says, blessed are you if you're watching for his return. Blessed are you. Assuredly, I say to you, he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. Well, that's going to be a mind blower. Jesus saves us from our sins. He's, he's everything to us. He's, he's Lord. We're his servants. We're waiting for his return. He comes back and we say, oh, praise the Lord. Finally, we've been waiting for you. And Jesus will say, oh, that's awesome. Now sit down. Let me serve you. Let me minister to you. I got some great food prepared for you. Awesome food. How much bacon do you want? How much prime rib and lobster do you want? So they say, well, wait, he's Jewish and he's kosher. Look, the New Testament says we can have all things because it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. What would you like to eat? What do you want on your pizza? He's going to sit down and gird himself. And if he should come, verse 38, if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch, if it's not right now, but it's going to be a little later, or maybe September 6, 2009. No, I'm not setting a date. But he could. Could be today. But if he should come back at that time and find them so, find us watching for his return, blessed are those servants. But know this. He gives this contrast to illustrate a point. Know this, that if the master of the house had, had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. The house was spared because the master of the house was expectant and ready. And he says, therefore you also be ready. Don't let the return of Jesus come to you like a thief in the night when you're not ready. Be ready. Therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You know, believing that Jesus is coming back benefits and blesses us on multitudes of levels. Jesus said, first of all, you are blessed if you expect me to come back. Specifically how? Well, if we truly believe that Jesus is coming back soon, certainly it would change our attitudes about many things. Number one, we'd be less sinful. Who here wants Jesus to come back and find them doing wrong? Anybody here want Jesus to come back and find you doing wrong? I don't think so. Number two, we'd be more evangelical. We'd be more burdened for our loved ones. We don't want to see them go to hell. And God has placed within us the gospel. And he expects us to tell those who don't believe that Jesus loves them. He died on a cross and rose from the dead. And he'll forgive all their sins and give them eternal life if they would just believe in him. That's the gospel, the treasure that we have in the, these earthen vessels that we call our bodies. God wants us to give it out. We'd be less sinful. We'd be more evangelical. Thirdly, we'd be less carnal. Let's face it. If we really believe Jesus was coming back at any time, do physical things matter? Does it matter about the, the better boat and the better car and the better house and the better this and the better that? Why pursue those earthly pleasures and treasures that are all going to be left behind anyway when Jesus comes back. You know, I've um, attended many funerals in my life. I've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. I've never seen a, a hearse pulling a, a trailer filled with the person's, the dead person's treasures. I remember years ago, one lady was so obsessed over her, her um, 
uh, d- 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 what was that car? The Jaguar, thank you. That she wanted to be buried in it and have the thing encased in cement. And of course her kids were upset because they wanted the Jag and they tried to fight it in the courts, but then they finally gave into a request. They dug a hole, they put her in the driver's seat. I... And uh, there she was, you know. And they lowered her into the ground and poured a bunch of concrete all on top of that thing and her kids were just weeping over the Jag, most likely. Do you think that's doing her any good now? Think that Jaguar's doing her any good now? Did it help her eternity by focusing on some stupid car? If you have a Jaguar, I don't mean to say you have a stupid car. Please forgive me. It's not the point. The point is, we'd be less carnal if we really believed Jesus was coming back. It wouldn't be about our kingdom, it'd be about his kingdom. And fourthly, we'd be more prayerful. No question about it. If we really believe that Jesus is coming back at any time, we would pray much more because we know biblically that God hears prayers, he answers prayers, and that prayer changes things. When God's people pray, God does stuff. And don't you want to see God doing stuff? Jesus is coming back soon. Are you ready? Are you ready? Do you believe it? Believe that he's coming back because it'll change your life. Father, thank you for this time in your word. Lord, thank you that you've told us to be ready, to be watchful, that you could come at any time, to be busy about your work, ready, Lord, for your return. Help us to do so. Lord, show us how to do so. There are a lot of concepts here we've read about, but practically, Lord, we pray that you would help us to put these things into practice, to walk in what you call us to do, to be the people you want us to be. Lord, I pray that among other things, you give us a burden for prayer. We pray about loving one another and about loving you more. That would be our first and foremost prayer. And Lord, we would become a testimony of your love for us and our love for you. Make Calvary Chapel Bartlett not a bigger church in numbers per se, but a place where people love one another a a body of believers that loves one another and that loves you. Lord, that's what I pray. That's what we all pray. And by this all we'll know that we are your disciples because we have love for one another. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.